So, my name is James Arapel. I spent the second half of July in Syria um, with a delegation that included two boxers and four members of the organization that I'm a part of called Hands Off Syria. Um, over the past few weeks, um, a lot of you would have noticed that there's been a lot of media attention on Syria because of the refugee crisis. Uh, this is now being exploited by our government to justify airstrikes in Syria on the pretext that they're targeting ISIS in order to protect civilians. So yes, um, our media has uh, quite rightly expressed shock, horror and condemnation at the sheer brutality of ISIS, at their um, violent sectarian rhetoric and the horrible massacres that they've committed. But in doing that, they tend to also obscure the reasons why ISIS has become as powerful as it is today. What the corporate media won't talk about is the extent to which the West and their regional allies are responsible for a lot of the bloodshed in Syria. Uh, by arming, funding, training and hosting the various militias waging war against the Syrian state today. So just to give you a bit of background on Syria, we were told in 2011 that the Syrian people rose up against their government demanding democracy and were then met with severe state repression which lasted for months on end until eventually those same democratic protesters took up arms to overthrow the state. What actually happened was that the government was faced with protests demanding democratic reforms by people who had genuine grievances. We don't disagree with that at all. Which the government proceeded to implement and that's the part that's missing in the media narrative that uh, dominates the West. Um, at the same time as this, an Islamist insurgency erupted in March 2011 to try and overthrow the Syrian state and naturally, like any state would, would do, the Syrian government proceeded to fight against them. Um, and in that period of time, over the past four and a half years since this has started, the United States, Britain, France, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Jordan and Israel have all played a part in either arming, funding, training or hosting on their territory those militants fighting the Syrian government. So since we're talking about the geopolitics of this war, it's important to ask why they supported the insurgency, what do they gain from it, and what their interests are. So let's begin with Israel. So what have they done? Israel has treated wounded al-Nusra and free Syrian army militants in their hospitals. Uh, by the way, when I say al-Nusra, I'm referring to uh, al-Qaeda's franchise in Syria. So um, here you can see a, a picture of Benjamin Netanyahu treating one of the injured militants. Israel has repeatedly launched airstrikes against the Syrian army and against Hezbollah in ways that tactically benefit the insurgency fighting the Syrian government. And the evidence of such collaboration came out in a UN report, which I put in just one excerpt of it, but it's actually 14 pages long. If you're really interested, I'd, I'd encourage you to read it. It's all, it's all on the UN website. Um, and a few weeks ago, the Syrian Air Force actually shot down an Israeli fighter jet that was launching airstrikes at Syrian army positions. So when I was in Syria, I was talking to my friend Sam, who fights for the government in the National Defense Forces, which was... Um, which are civilian uh, militias that were formed um, to fight alongside the army. And he was telling me about how they often find Israeli bulletproof vests on the bodies of dead insurgents, which gives you an idea of the type of support that Israel is offering these insurgents. So then the question becomes, why is Israel doing this? So the main reason is that Syria has a long history of supporting Palestinian resistance. So in the last uh, Gaza war, even though it was a massacre, um, even though the, the Palestinians were ruthlessly slaughtered by the Zionist entity, uh, to the extent that the Palestinians were able to defend themselves, it was because of the weapons that they had received from Iran, Syria and Hezbollah. Israel doesn't forget, for example, that Syria and Iran are the reasons why South Lebanon is not uh, an Israeli-occupied territory, like the West Bank. That's because Syria and Iran supported the Lebanese resistance, especially Hezbollah, which forced the Zionists to withdraw in 2000. And six years later, when the Zionists tried invading Lebanon again, they were convincingly beaten back by Hezbollah. And it's for these reasons that the Zionists have a genuine interest in breaking the Iran-Syria-Hezbollah axis. That, um, and this is something that's been admitted by Israeli officials as well. 
So um, just going back to the previous uh, slide, uh, that's one of the articles where Amos Gillard, who's an IDF um, uh, official, he says that al the Al Qaeda threat is not as serious as the Syria, Iran, Hezbollah axis. And so they have an interest in breaking this axis. Uh, the United States shares these interests as well, but here's the irony. So when the United States invaded Iraq in 2003, they thought they could install a puppet regime, but that didn't happen. Instead, the Iraqis elected a government in Baghdad that till today continues to be a strong ally of Iran. And the reason that they were granted elections is because the Americans had to make a concession to the Iraqi people. Um, in fact, after Israel's defeat in 2006, um, in the 2006 war with Lebanon, that is, um, they quietly criticized the US invasion of Iraq for strengthening Iran and expanding their regional influence, which then strengthened uh, Hezbollah as well. It's in this context that the emergence of ISIS should be understood. To cut the long story short, for lack of time, from 2006 onwards, the United States began destabilizing the very Iraqi government that they had helped bring to power. And they did this to counter Iranian influence. In practice, this meant, at the very least, turning a blind eye to the funding of Al-Qaeda in Iraq by Saudi Arabia, which, for those of you who don't know, is a staunch ally of the United States. Al-Qaeda in Iraq was renamed the Islamic State of Iraq in 2006. Then, in early 2012, the Islamic State of Iraq established the Al-Nusra Front in Syria. And then, in April 2013, a large portion of al-Nusra Pride fighters merged back with the Islamic State of Iraq to form the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or ISIS as it's known today. Now it goes by the name of just the Islamic State. To put it bluntly, the United States is directly responsible for the rise of ISIS. So according to the Washington Post, uh, yeah, according to the Washington Post, which obtained documents from Edward Snowden, one dollar out of every fifteen dollars of the CIA's budget, which is around one billion dollars, has been spent on destabilizing Syria. This was spent on training ten thousand mercenaries fighting the Syrian government. Once these militants have been trained, either in Turkey or in Jordan, they are then free to cross the border into Syria and join whatever brigade they wish. And often the brigades will switch their allegiances purely out of convenience. And this was uh, this is screenshots that I took on uh, from, from an ABC documentary and here you can see that they're interviewing these fighters, these captured ISIS fighters and the first one says, during the, the war I joined the Free Syrian Army then I moved to ISIS and the Christians are heretics, we must kill them all, which is just very typical of ISIS of course. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, the, the, the fact is that a lot of the people that the United States would have spent money training, it's, there's a high probability that they would have ended up joining groups like ISIS anyway. So, was this an unintended cons consequence of US foreign policy or was it an accident? In April this year, the Defense Intelligence Agency declassified a document from August 2011 which stated that the United States knew that Al-Qaeda in Iraq was a major player in the insurgency. Um, today, the United States is still committed to arming, funding, and training the so-called moderate rebels that are fighting the Syrian government. And this is a policy that our government uh, still supports to this day. So, if you remember the, the statements by Julie Bishop, she said that Australia's initial focus, or short-term focus, was to fight against ISIS, but she also, she also mentioned that Australia's long-term commitment would also be to support the overthrow of the, the Syrian government and that Australia was basically following the American, um, American policy on this question. Um, so who are the, the moderate rebels, Obama's moderate rebels, um, that, uh, that you hear about in the media? Well, according to James Clapper, who's the Director of National Intelligence for the US government, Moderate these days is increasingly becoming anyone who is not affiliated with ISIS. So this includes the Al-Nusra Front, which I mentioned earlier. Israel collaborates with them. Um, this is Syria's Al-Qaeda franchise. This is the same group that's believed to have been behind a bomb attack targeting school children in Homs, which killed 41 children 
in October last year. And it's the same group that massacred 20 civilians in Idlib in June this year. So that's the, the news excerpts, you know. So you've got the one on the left where it talks about um, the civilians who were massacred. They were massacred because they, they belonged to a, a religious minority in Syria um, who Jabhat al-Nusra have been uh, attempting to force to convert to, to their warped interpretation of Islam. Um, it would also include, that's the moderate rebels that I'm talking about, uh, brigades that still fight under the banner of the Free Syrian Army, whose crimes include executing postal workers in Aleppo in 2012 and throwing their bodies off the rooftops. They then recorded this massacre and bragged about it. Um, and they did this on the grounds that those workers were regime collaborators, essentially. Um, the Free Syrian Army, the different Free Syrian Army brigades have also blown up hospitals in Homs and Aleppo just to name a few of the acts of terrorism that they've committed. So these are the moderate rebels and these are the people that the United States have stated openly that they're willing to support um, if it means fighting against the Syrian government. So why does the United States claim to be targeting ISIS now? Now, there's a lot of speculation on this question but I'll try and keep it short and just mention a few of the possible reasons. Given that America's close ally Turkey is hosting ISIS on their territory, and allowing them to flow across the border into Syria, and given that their other close ally, Saudi Arabia, is funding ISIS, and given that the United States acknowledges this to be the case, if they really wanted to weaken, if not defeat ISIS, they begin by demanding that their own allies stop funding them and stop hosting them. Given that they won't do any of these things, suggest that the real aim of their airstrikes has nothing to do with defeating ISIS at all, um, and is more likely to be about the United States containing ISIS while at the same time protecting the moderate rebels who they've vetted as being the preferred agents of regime change in Syria. So if the actions of the United States are indicative of their intentions, then it would, it would appear that their plans are to partition Syria and Iraq into smaller states and that the last thing the US wants is for an independent bloc of stable countries to form uh, with normal, friendly relations with each other. Moving on to uh, the countries that I've already mentioned, so Turkey, Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Qatar and Saudi Arabia in particular are major oil producers who view Iran as their principal enemy in the region and also their competitive for economic reasons and they spent billions financing the insurgency in Syria um, including to groups like ISIS, as the US acknowledges. So why are they doing this? In 2007, the world's largest gas reserves were discovered in the Persian Gulf. It was then shared between Iran and Qatar. Iran proceeded to build a pipeline that travels through Iraq, and it was intended to reach Syria's Mediterranean coast. It wasn't completed because the Syrian war, um, so far it's reached the outskirts of Damascus. Um, because the Syrian war happened. That's the reason why the pipeline wasn't able to be completed. If that pipeline was completed, it would mean that the European Union would get the majority of its, uh, of its gas, oil and gas, um, in the next 30 years from two countries, Russia and Iran, and that would be extremely bad for the United States and their competitive interests in the region, as well as their allies who are major oil producers like Saudi Arabia. Um, Qatar also saw that as a major competitive because they wanted to pipe the gas that they had, they had gotten out of that discovery. They wanted to pipe this gas through Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and through Syria, through to Turkey, but Syria rejected this offer in 2009. So in other words, when countries like Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Qatar talk about countering Iranian influence, or containing Iran, or breaking the, the so-called Shiite axis, um, it's because they have a direct material interest in overthrowing the Syrian government and replacing it with a government that will prioritize their economic interests. Or at least that's one of the very strong um, explanations to explain, like I said, actions are indicative of intentions and that's one way of looking at it. Moving on to my final point, the war on Syria is also an economic war. So you have to ask yourself, if the West was really interested in defeating ISIS, why are they imposing crippling economic sanctions on Syria 
which is strangling and suffocating the economy of the only state that has the capacity to defeat ISIS in Syria. Why? The financial sanctions imposed on Syria by the United States in August 2011 has inflicted a major blow to the, to the purchasing power of the Syrian pound, uh, which is the Syrian currency, um, and that's caused it to depreciate by sixfold over the course of the war. The price of medicines has skyrocketed as a result of these sanctions, and to make matters worse, the groups fighting the government have systematically bombed hospitals as well. And um, when we were in Syria, that's part of the reason why we donated uh, $10,000 to Syria's national healthcare system. Um, it's not a huge amount in the grand scheme of things, but it was our way of extending practical solidarity to the state that actually has to bear, these, bear this horrible burden. The price of oil has also skyrocketed, especially after Syria's limited oil resources were taken over by al-Nusra and later ISIS. And that's why I'd like you to pay attention to um, the second one, the one on the right. The EU decision to lift Syrian oil sanctions boosts jihadist, boost jihadist groups. What does that mean? Um, when the Syrian government controlled those oil fields, um, the EU, the European Union, had imposed an oil embargo uh, which deprived the Syrian government of a very important source of revenue. When Jabhat al-Nusra and later ISIS took over those oil fields, the European Union uh, quickly lifted that oil embargo, thereby financing the insurgency via the theft of Syria's national resources. So, in conclusion, when you consider the amount of money that's been spent on arming, funding and training some of the most reactionary and sectarian death squads that are ripping Syria to pieces as we speak, then this war can only be described as the most well-funded proxy war in modern history. Nonetheless, the Syrian army continues to fight on, and that's because, I would argue, it has the support of the majority of Syrians. The Syrian army is a conscript <coughs> army. Uh, the soldiers who fight, the overwhelming majority of them, do not have an institutional investment to be there. They fight because, the way they see it, they're defending their towns, their cities, their schools, their hospitals, their factories, their churches and their mosques from this plan to destroy Syria by the forces that I've mentioned so far. And I've always said that if the Syrian government falls, it would open a dark chapter in the pages of Syrian history. And everything about, the Syri about Syria, about this country that is progressive and is worth defending, namely its inclusive secular national identity, its economic independence, these are things that would be destroyed. Just on the question of economic independence, I mean, a lot of, because of all the negative things that are said about Syria, a lot of people forget that prior to the war, this is a country that had a per capita GDP of only $3,000, which isn't much. And yet, when it came to objective human development indicators like life expectancy, education, the status of, of women, um, the, the amount of emphasis that Syria put on uh, teaching its population, its role in history, and, and all of those things, like Syria was far better and far more progressive than any other, pretty much every other country in the Middle East. When it comes to like per capita GDP, Syria was probably the third or fourth poorest country of all the Arab countries. But when it came to life expectancy, it had the third highest. It had a very good healthcare system. And so the Syrian people, when, when I say that they support their government, I'm not saying that they support President Bashar al-Assad, although a lot of Syrians do genuinely admire and respect him. They support their government and their army because they understand that the alternative would be to see their country descend into chaos and, and they know that the civil war would not end if the Syrian government were to be overthrown. After the Afghan government was, was overthrown in 1992, did that, did that war end? No. The various Mujahideen uh, factions proceeded to rip Afghanistan to pieces and destroy Kabul over a period of three years. So the lessons of history have to be learned. And the lessons of history um, suggest that wars that are imposed on countries from outside powers, um, and, and especially Syria, because there are no, because the overwhelming majority of people who are fighting to defend the Syrian government are Syrians themselves, um, these do not end well because then the vultures, the, the other countries that are involved in fueling the war, they then proceed to take chunks out of that country for, them, for themselves and to further their own interests.
And it's for these reasons and many others that I believe we have an obligation to stand with Syria. Thank you very much.